heroes, popes in hard times. Blessed Pope Pius IX, 1792 to 1878, hero of the 19th century. Family, the Lord has given the church many heroes down through the centuries, and each person he gives is for a specific reason for a specific time, but not only for that time. The 19th century is a perfect example of that. The church suffered greatly during that century. The Lord knew we needed him to be at our side to assure us that he will keep his promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. We have an expression which you may have read in any one of our books. In times of crisis, God sends us signal grace. This grace may come from Eucharistic miracles, apparitions by Our Lady, our saints, and other powerful men and women in the church. It may come in the form of angelic intercession. It will come from anywhere the Lord deems necessary. There is only one thing of which we can be assured. It will come. He will use whatever or whoever it takes, whenever it is needed, to protect us from anything or anyone who will bring us anywhere near the brink of hell. Very often, even if it means protecting us from ourselves. The signal grace we want to focus on in this chapter, the special powerful men in our church we want to share with you, is Blessed Pope Pius IX. He was elected Pope at one of the most crucial periods in the history of the church and remained at the helm of the ship of the church longer than any Pope before or since, 32 years. He is responsible for many great battles waged and won during his papacy, including, but not limited, to the dogma of papal infallibility, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady, the short-lived Vatican I, and his ongoing battle against the elements who were out to destroy the Church, namely, the beginnings of the New Age movement and the liberals all over Europe, but especially Victor Emmanuel in Italy, who not only plotted to steal the papal lands, he ultimately forced our Pope to end his pontificate as a self-imposed prisoner inside the Vatican walls. This and many other attacks made against Pope Pius IX, lovingly called Pio Nono, cost him much grief throughout his papacy, but the Lord kept him in charge for 32 years for a good reason. There was a job to be done. God knew Pius IX could get the job done. A saint is born. Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti was born in 1792 in the sleepy coastal town of Senigalia off the Adriatic coast, a short 50 kilometers from the Holy House of Loreto. No wonder he always has such a devotion to Our Lady all his life. He was born in the shadow of her embrace. He was the last child of nine of the family of Girolamo Mastai Ferretti and Countess Caterina Solazzi, so he was of the nobility. However, they were not a wealthy family. But that did not affect his great love from an early childhood of his faith and his church. He is given credit with having received his great love for Our Lady from his saintly mother, who also had a devotion to Mary. We don't know for sure, but isn't it possible that he was baptized and received First Holy Communion at the Holy House in Loreto, which has always been an honor for families in the Marche region of Italy? Perhaps he was confirmed there and spent quiet time in a corner of the Basilica, like St. Francis de Sales, praying the rosary and asking for Our Lady's aid in his life as his fellow Pope, John Paul II would do almost a century later. He showed a desire for the religious life at an early age, which his family honored and supported. His primary education was directed by his mother, who gave him his foundation in religion, and especially his love for Our Lady. He didn't enter into his formal education until he was 11 years old, when he was enrolled at St. Michael's School in Tuscany. He began his classical studies at the Pierrest College in Volterra, but had to return home due to poor health. He continued on at the Rome College. This was also interrupted, however, this time by political unrest in Rome. Napoleon Bonaparte, 
a flame from the pit of hell. The political unrest we refer to here was Napoleon Bonaparte. Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti lived during the dreaded occupation by Napoleon, who had a horrendous relationship with Pope Pius VII from the time he took over France in 1801. He had manipulated Pope Pius VII into signing the Concordat of 1801 to reestablish the church in France, which will be controlled by Napoleon and his henchmen. This meant that the government of Napoleon will decide church policy in France and its conquered countries, and who will determine who will be ordained bishops and the like. This was not a new thing in France. In 1682, what was called Gallicanism was proclaimed, which stated briefly that the Pope's power was limited in certain countries in France in this instance in that it was subordinate to the ruler of said country, secondly, to the general council of the country, and thirdly, to the bishops of that country. The Pope's decrees could only have the stamp of infallibility if the local bishops agreed. And last but not least, the Pope's authority in temporal matters was subject to the customs of the particular country which was involved. This abuse of power by the French or Gallican countries went way back to the time of Philip the Fair, a very greedy French king who ruled from 1285 to 1314. He will do just about anything to finance his treasuries and his projects. He arrested Jews so that he could take over their properties to finance his wars. He also taxed the Catholic Church for half of their annual income. This created a near revolution by the bishops of the church against the king. The Pope Boniface VIII issued a papal bull forbidding any property to be confiscated by the French king. But the Pope died, and his successor, Clement V, a weak man and a French Pope, first of the Avignon Popes, gave in to just about all of Philip's demands, which included the creation of a Gallican church, as well as the rape and slaughter of the Knights Templar and the theft of the treasury. So you might say, in effect, that the privileges or abuses taken by the French kings and later on attempted by the German princes who claimed to be descendants of Charlemagne and therefore had a French strain in their heritage began way back in the late 13th century and early 14th centuries. We would like to take a quotation from the Catholic Encyclopedia. But Gallicanism was more than pure speculation. It reacted from the domain of theory into that of facts. The bishops and magistrates of France used it, the former as warrant for increased power in the government of dioceses, the latter to extend their jurisdiction so as to cover ecclesiastical affairs. Moreover, there was an Episcopal and political Gallicanism and a parliamentary or judicial Gallicanism. The former lessened the doctrinal authority of the Pope in favor of that of the bishops, to the degree marked by the Declaration of 1682, the latter affecting the relations of the temporal and spiritual powers, tended to augment the rights of the state more and more to the prejudice of those of the Church on the grounds of what they called the liberties of the Gallican Church. This is what Napoleon was trying to impose on the Vatican. Pope Pius VII emphatically refused. This did not bode well with the little Frenchman from Corsica. Then Napoleon forced Pope Pius VII to come to Paris in 1804 to crown him emperor, and during the ceremony at Notre Dame Cathedral, at the last moment, Napoleon brazenly took the crown from the hands of Pope Pius VII and crowned himself. This was a symbol that Napoleon was not subject to the authority of the Pope. So there was bad blood between them, but the final straw came when Napoleon stole the papal lands from Pope Pius VII, who promptly excommunicated Napoleon and everyone involved with this. Napoleon, for his part, promptly reacted by having Pope Pius VII arrested in the dark of the night in July 1809, and deported from Italy to Fontainebleau, France, where he was held prisoner until March 1814. 
It wasn't until after the opponent's great defeat that the Pope returned to Rome and put his house back in order. It was a difficult time for Pope Pius VII and our church, but he did regain his popularity, actually more so than he had enjoyed prior to Napoleon. He was hailed as a hero, the one who stood up to Napoleon. All of the above is to give you an idea of what was going on in the life of young Giovanni Mastai Ferretti during the years of 1810 through 1814. Every time he tried to continue his education in Rome, either bad health or bad Napoleon interfered. However, as all things passed, Napoleon's reign of terror came to an end and our future Pope's health was restored somewhat, at least enough for him to be able to return to Rome to continue his studies. One of the first things Pope Pius VII did when he regained the power of his office in Rome was to reinstate the Jesuits who had been suppressed by Napoleon. Young Giovanni Mastai Ferretti volunteered to work in an orphanage with the Jesuits prior to his ordination. However, during these five years, he was constantly being attacked by bouts of sickness, so seriously that he became greatly concerned that he would not be able to be ordained. This is when his problem came to the attention of Pope Pius VII. He was compassionate, open to the young man's overpowering desire to be a priest, and gave special permission for him to enter the seminary. Perhaps the Lord brought this young man to the attention of Pope Pius VII and whispered in his ear that he was chosen, much like David was chosen and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was chosen. Giovanni Mastai Ferretti was ordained in 1819. The Beginnings of His Priestly Life Father Mastai Ferretti continued to draw the interest of Pope Pius VII. He was personally assigned by the Pope to be spiritual director at an orphanage. Then, in 1823, again through the influence of Pope Pius VII, he was given a special assignment to join an apostolic mission to Chile. Thus, Giovanni Mastai Ferretti became the first Pope, future Pope, to visit the New World. He worked as auditor to the Apostolic Nuncio, Bishop Muzzi, for two years. This was the last time this Pope would aid our future Pope in his lifetime. Pope Pius VII went to his reward on August 20, 1823. We're sure that he continued to guide the young priest throughout his life from heaven. Upon Father Mastai Ferretti's return to Rome, he was given a very prestigious position as director of a hospital in Rome, San Michele, a position usually reserved for someone of the rank of cardinal. This is another indicator of how much the powers of the Holy See felt this young priest had a bright future in the church. He did not fail that confidence, but performed admirably in his position at the hospital, so much so that he was ordained Archbishop of Espoleto by Pope Leo XII in 1827. Keep in mind that he had only been a priest for eight years when he became bishop. This was probably the first test of his mettle in a diocesan situation. The Archdiocese of Espoleto was not in good condition for a new prelate to take over. There was little or no enforcement of rules, and the Archdiocese was generally run poorly. Archbishop Mastai Ferretti was able to turn things around in his first three years there, so much so that when a revolution of all the papal states against the election of Gregory XVI broke out all over Europe, Mastai Ferretti was able to control the people in his archdiocese. He actually sympathized with the nationalist movement in Italy at that time. He grieved over the shedding of blood. He would do anything to prevent it. He was able to calm the storm. After it was put down, he was able to obtain a pardon for everyone in his diocese, even though there were many who were the cause of the problem in the first place. However, he wanted peace at all costs and truly believed in what the nationalists were trying to accomplish. Because of this, he was labeled a liberal bishop and became very popular to the people, which was needed to offset the negative feelings towards Pope Gregory XVI and the Papal States. 
He would, however, live to regret that decision after he became Pope. He was promoted to the position of bishop in the Diocese of Imola. While it would seem like a lateral move or actually a step down because he went from being archbishop to bishop, it was good for his grooming as the Diocese of Imola was important, actually larger than Espoleto, and many popes had served in the Diocese of Imola. So he was really on track. This change took place in 1832, and he remained in this position until 1846, when Pope Gregory died. The Diocese of Imola was also not without problems, but our future Pope focused on the spiritual welfare of his people, as well as their physical concerns. He worked tirelessly with his priests and seminarians, fully aware that it was through them that the Church would thrive. He stressed the need for education, especially Catholic education. This was in the midst of a potential time bomb ready to explode politically. For all his labors, during this time, he was raised to the prestigious position of Cardinal. The Lord gives us the gift of Pope Pius IX. We want to take a minute out here to just thank our Lord Jesus for having given us the gift of Blessed Pope Pius IX. Very often, we don't know, we find out in retrospect just how the Lord has been in charge of our destiny. He is always there to watch over us. We don't always realize this until after the fact. Not having been alive from 1846 to 1878, we don't know if we would have been aware as it was happening just how the Lord was with us. Now, 150 years after the fact, we can say, Wow, look how awesome the Lord is. He was protecting us through Pope Pius IX. But back then, 150 years ago, did they really understand what was happening? Communications were a lot different at that period in our history. It was a difficult, tense time. In retrospect, we can see how the Lord put the right men in the right job. But as we say today, where are all the saints? We used to have all these saints who protected and guided us. Where are their saints today? And then the Lord reminds us how he gave us St. Don Bosco and St. Therese the Little Flower and St. Bernadette of Lourdes in the 19th century, and Maximilian Kolbe and Edith Stein, Padre Pio, and Mother Teresa, and Pope John Paul II in the 20th century. And we have been blessed to be in the presence of a living saint, Mother Angelica, this last 20 odd years to sit at her side and listen to her as she shares her spirituality with us. How many other saints are there out there today? just doing what the Lord wants with no thought of canonization or world renown, just as those mentioned about most likely never thought about being saints? Pope Pius IX was one of those people without whom we might not have survived from the 19th century to the 20th century to now the 21st century. Do you know what we're saying? When you say to yourself, Lord, where are you? Just look at those dear people whom we know about who did the Lord's work in the last 100 years. And those are just the ones we know about. And so we say, thank you, God, for watching out for us. Out of the frying pan, Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti was elected Pope in 1846, taking the name of Pius IX in honor of Pius VII who had been such a good friend and mentor to Mastai Ferretti, who actually was responsible for his becoming a priest and in his climb up the hierarchical ladder. Some thought his election was a surprise. Others thought he had been strongly considered from the very beginning of the conclave. He had shown the people as a young bishop in Spoleto that he had feelings for them. He spoke out about the need for reform of the papal states. He had even expressed sympathy for the nationalist. He might have been considered a good balance between the liberal and conservative factions in the Roman Curia. He was given the label liberal almost immediately, partly because of his earlier stand during the near revolution of the Papal States. We have to take a moment out here to explain why the liberal element had become so strong in Italy. For centuries, Italy had been ruled by foreigners 
who had systematically chopped up the provinces into little kingdoms. When Napoleon came in and conquered Italy, he crowned himself king of Italy, Napoleon I. He actually united Italy. During his reign, words like unification and constitution began being thrown around. He had done something that no one had ever been able to do. He also proved to the people of Italy that it could be done. So when he went out of power and the Congress of Vienna put everything back the way it had been prior to Napoleon's takeover, it was not at all what they had wanted. They had a taste of unification and will never be satisfied until it had been accomplished. This is what our Pope Pius IX stepped into when he accepted the task of ruling the church and the papal states. It was not going to be easy. He realized he was in a hotbed of chaos, so he did all he could to appease the anger and feelings of abandonment in the people and calm the revolutionary factions. He tried to win the rank and file over immediately. He made many concessions. He gave money to the poor, released prisoners from jail. He did all the things Jesus tells us to do as good shepherds of the flock. But you must remember, in addition to being the spiritual leader for the millions of Catholics in the world, he was also the secular or worldly leader of those people. He was like a king or an emperor. He had lands. He had an army. He had people whom he had to take care of. People had complaints about the state. He was the state. He was the last of the temporal popes in the history of our church. He didn't know it at the time. But by trying to be fair and equitable, he wound up playing into the hands of those who will betray him and do away with the papal states altogether. To those who wanted an independent, united Italy, they needed the support of the Pope. Italy was all chopped up. Austria controlled Venice and Milan. The French stationed themselves in Ancona. Naples and Sicily were occupied by the Bourbons, who were also French. With each concession he made, he felt he would appease the masses, and the pressure would be relieved, the situation would be resolved. But all he did was cause the liberals to demand more. They actually misread him. They thought for sure that he would support a change in power. By the time he realized what he had done, it was too late. Pope Pius IX was manipulated into granting a constitution in March of 1848. But a major demand of the revolutionaries was that he, as head of the papal states, declare war on Austria, whom the Italians hated. He was between a rock and a hard place, damned if he did and damned if he didn't. While he agreed to the constitution, he really could not declare war on Austria. He was their spiritual leader. The pressure cooker which was building in Rome exploded when, in an allocution of April 29, he stated that as father of Christendom, he could never declare war on Austria. Riots broke out immediately. He was condemned as a traitor. His ability to rule as head of the Papal States was put into question. Revolutions took place all over Italy. The Pope's Prime Minister was assassinated on the steps of the Cancelleria, and the Pope found himself having to give in to their demands and abandoning the Vatican and escaping to a refuge in Gaeta, which at the time was part of the Kingdom of Naples. During his absence, the liberals attempted to wipe out his temporal powers and proclaim a democratic republic. Pius IX reached out to France, Austria, and Spain to help quell the situation. France brought troops into Rome and brought the rebellion to an end. Pius was able to return in 1850 complete with his temporal powers. He maintained throughout his papacy that he wanted to leave the papacy as he found it, with the papal states intact. When he returned to Rome, he was no longer a liberal. He had learned a very hard lesson. He changed from a liberal to an ultra-conservative. He was actually called Pio Nono Secondo, Pope Pius IX II alluding to the fact that he was, for all intents and purposes, a new pope, a different pope, the second Pius IX. The beginning of the end. But it was just a matter of time before he would have to give in to the ongoing demands against his power. 
The political climate of the whole world was changing. The Revolutionary War in America and the French Revolution were just the beginning of the new demand of people to control their lives and the destinies of their countries. He tried to distance himself from the secular aspect of his pontificate. He appointed a Secretary of State, Cardinal Giacomo Antonelli, who was actually better suited for the role than the Pope. The Cardinal stayed in this position until his death in 1876. It was an ongoing battle to maintain a control of his temporal powers as head of the Papal States. Antonelli took most of the flag for His Holiness, but even he could not stem the tide of nationalism which was taking over the country. Now granted, it was not all a sense of national pride that spurred Victor Emmanuel and his cohorts on. There was an overpowering desire to get foreign powers out of the country, and secondly, to take power away from the Pope, which would in fact happen if the foreign elements were removed. So this is what they worked on for the next 20 years. And eventually they were able to have their way. In 1859, Napoleon III and his military strategist worked out a plan to begin a war against Austria and the Sardinian Kingdom. Once Austria was out of the way, they went full force to annex the Papal States such as Umbria and the Marches. When Pope Pius IX rejected this act, they threatened to take them over by means of war. Our Pope could not condone needless bloodshed, but knew that if he did not defend these two provinces, his hold on papal power would be lost. So he sent his troops into Castelfidaro and Ancona, and suffering defeat in both campaigns, the die was cast. Pius controlled only Rome and the Latium. The situation depreciated badly over the next 10 years, not only in Italy, but all over Europe. Martin Luther and his followers had weakened the church badly in Germany. Switzerland, Poland, and Russia were soon to follow suit. Royalties and tithes were withheld, property seized, schools taken over by secular power, churches and monasteries closed. Religious orders were banished, bishops exiled or imprisoned. The atrocities against the church were outrageous. Pope Pius IX attempted to resolve issues through negotiations. No matter where he turned, he was being attacked. Concordats were written, agreed upon, then disregarded like so much trash. Anti-clerical sentiments were at an all-time high. All the various countries took their turns to take pot shots at the church, much like they are doing today. Even in South America and Mexico, anti-Catholic legislation was being imposed on the church and the people. It was almost like little kids who finally didn't have to obey their parents anymore. They were getting even for having to be good all those years. History does repeat itself. Today, we're finding the exact same thing happening. Cheap shots and accusations of the church are becoming a cottage industry. The Pope found he was battling on all fronts. While he could not disregard the real threat outside the country, in Italy he could feel himself being squeezed tighter and tighter with Victor Emmanuel, united with Cavour and Garibaldi, pushing and pushing until our Pope was backed into a corner. By the decree non expedite of 29 February 1868, Pope Pius tried to forbid Italian Catholics from participating in the political life and especially in the election of representatives of the Kingdom of Italy under pain of serious sin. Unfortunately, most Italians pay no attention to this decree any more than they did when Pope John Paul II pleaded with them not to vote for abortion. They disregarded the Pope, abortion was passed, and today the Italian government is paying families to have children. Ultimately and sadly, on September 20, 1870, a day celebrated as a holiday in Rome, the anti-papal forces invaded Rome and occupied the city. The following month, October, a vote was taken, and by a staggering majority, the people chose to have Rome made the capital of Italy. With this act, Victor Emmanuel effectively wiped out the papal states altogether. 
As a token gesture to appease the Pope, the Italian government on 13 May 1871 issued the so-called Law of the Papal Guarantees, which was to secure to the Pope his sovereignty, the inviolability of his person, as well as the freedom of the conclave and of the ecumenical councils. In addition to this, a yearly pension of 3,225,000 lira was voted to him. The Vatican, the Lateran, and Castel Gandolfo were declared extraterritorial. He could use them, but they didn't belong to the church, but to the state. Pius IX, in order to maintain his protest against the seizure of the states of the church, refused to accept the law and shut himself up in the Vatican for the rest of his life. Pope Pius IX would have nothing to do with the Italian government. Although he could come and go as he pleased for the rest of his life, he withdrew to the Vatican and considered himself a prisoner. He remained under what he termed house arrest for the rest of his life. All popes from that time until the Lateran Treaties of 1929 also considered themselves prisoners of the Vatican out of respect for Pope Pius IX. In 1929, Mussolini wrote a treaty with Pope Pius XI, whereby the Vatican State was created, which exists today. As part of that treaty, Roman Catholicism was declared the state religion of Italy. There was only one change. In 1984, when Catholicism was declared to be no longer the state-supported religion, so what God through the Emperor Constantine was able to accomplish in the 4th century was stricken down by the forces of evil in the late 20th century. Remember what we said about abortion a few paragraphs ago? Watch, they'll learn their lesson. The Power of God Working in Men From what you've just read, you must think to yourself, how did that poor man get anything done as Pope with all the political struggles he found himself and meshed in? That is men's logic, not God's. Pope Pius IX, from the very beginning, was destined to do great things for God. He wanted nothing more than to proclaim the word of God and to glorify his name through the life of this tortured servant. God would not let this man who fought his entire pontificate to protect and defend the church he loved so greatly, leave this earth without having made his mark. Pope Pius IX was a brave man, who probably worked better under pressure than in times of peace and calm. Well, actually, he never really had a time of peace and calm during most of his pontificate. At least now when he wrote his most brilliant dogmas and assembled the Vatican Council. In 1864, Pope Pius issued what he called a Syllabus of Errors, which was an appendix to his encyclical Quanta Cura. In retrospect, we believe that he sent this list of errors to wake the world up to the ungodly direction in which they were heading. It was obvious that he was trying to give them a reality check. But they were too involved in self and in doing the work of the evil one to take notice. If you read between the lines, you will have some idea of what he was up against. As he was fighting a battle for the papal states, he was also fighting a battle for the souls of his spiritual children. Now there's always going to be an uproar when children are told by their parents that they are acting contrary to the rules. When the children are the various countries all over the world and the parent is the Pope, you know sparks are going to fly. It was very obvious that the Pope was taking jabs at the people and countries trying to destroy his church. But the errors which he condemned in this syllabus were solid problems, which the world had become comfortable with from the time of the Renaissance and then the French Revolution through the era of Napoleon and then countries like Austria and Russia also going against the Pope and the church. This syllabus of errors was actually begun in 1849 when then Archbishop Pecci of Espoleto, later Pope Leo XIII, suggested it to Pope Pius IX. Over a period of 15 years, in different allocutions or letters or encyclicals, Pope Pius IX covered all of these errors, but it was not put into a finished form until December 8, 1864, 
as part of the encyclical Quanta Cura. Most of the faithful had been instructed over the years in these errors, so they were ready for it when it came. However, many countries and heads of state reared their ugly heads and reacted poorly, to say the least. EWTN Library, headed by Colin Donovan, has put together the 80 errors, and so we are just going to list them without writing when they were introduced in what allocution. You will be able to read between the lines just what the problems our dear saintly Pope was experiencing at that time. Now keep in mind that all these errors are wrong and the Pope is condemning them. Do not think the Church is teaching these errors as truth. 1. Pantheism, Naturalism, and Absolute Rationalism 1. There exists no supreme, all-wise, all-provident divine being distinct from the universe, and God is identical with the nature of things and is, therefore, subject to changes. In effect, God is produced in men and in the world, and all things are God and have the very substance of God, and God is one and the same thing with the world. Wrong. Number two, all action of God upon men and the world is to be denied. Wrong. Three, Human reason without any reference whatsoever to God is the sole arbiter of truth and falsehood and of good and evil. It is law to itself and suffices by its natural force to secure the welfare of men and of nations. Wrong. 4. All the truths of religion proceed from the innate strength of human reason. Hence, reason is the ultimate standard by which men can and ought to arrive at the knowledge of all truths of every kind. Wrong. 5. Divine revelation is imperfect and therefore subject to a continual and indefinite progress corresponding with the advancement of human reason. Wrong. 6. The faith of Christ is in opposition to human reason and divine revelation not only is not useful, but is even hurtful to the perfection of men. Wrong. 7. The prophecies and miracles set forth and recorded in the sacred scriptures are the fiction of poets and the mysteries of the Christian faith, the result of philosophical investigations. In the books of the Old and New Testament, there are contained mythical inventions, and Jesus Christ is himself a myth. Wrong. Number two, moderate realism. Eight, as human reason is placed on a level with religion itself, so theological must be treated in the same manner as philosophical sciences. Wrong. Nine, all the dogmas of the Christian religion are indiscriminately the object of natural science or philosophy and human reason, enlightened solely in a historical way is able by its own natural strength and principles to attain to the true science of even the most abstruse dogmas, provided only that such dogmas be proposed to reason itself as its object. Wrong. 10. As the philosopher is one thing and philosophy another, so it is the right and duty of the philosopher to subject himself to the authority which he shall have proved to be true. But philosophy neither can nor ought to submit to any such authority. Wrong. 11. The church not only ought never to pass judgment on philosophy, but ought to tolerate the errors of philosophy, leaving it to correct itself. Wrong. 12. The decrees of the apostolic see and of the Roman congregations impede the true progress of science. Wrong. 13. The method and principles by which the old scholastic doctors cultivated theology are no longer suitable to the demands of our times and to the progress of the sciences. Wrong. 14. Philosophy is to be treated without taking any account of supernatural revelation. Wrong. Number 3. Indifferentism, Latitudinarianism. 15. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. Wrong. 16. Men may, 
in the observance of any religion whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. Wrong. 17. Good hope at least is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not at all in the true church of Christ. Wrong. 18. Protestantism is nothing more than another form of the same true Christian religion in which form it is given to please God equally as in the Catholic Church. Wrong. Number four. Socialism, communism, secret societies, biblical societies, clerical, liberal societies. Pests of this kind are frequently reprobated in the severest terms and encyclical. Qui pluribus? November 9th, 1846, Allocution, Quibus Quantisque, April 20th, 1849, Encyclical Nocitis and Noviscum, December 8th, 1849, Allocution, Singulari Quadum, December 9th, 1854, Encyclical Quanto Conficiamur, August 10th, 1863. Number 5. Errors Concerning the Church and Her Rights 19. The Church is not a true and perfect society, entirely free, nor is she endowed with power and perpetual rights of her own, conferred upon her by her divine founder, but it appertains to the civil power to define what are the rights of the Church and the limits within which she may exercise those rights. Wrong. 20. The ecclesiastical power ought not to exercise its authority without the permission and assent of the civil government. Wrong. 21. The Church has not the power of defining dogmatically that the religion of the Catholic Church is the only true religion. Wrong. 22. The obligation by which Catholic teachers and authors are strictly bound is confined to those things only which are proposed to universal belief as dogmas of faith by the infallible judgment of the Church. Wrong. 23. Roman pontiffs and ecumenical councils have wandered outside the limits of their powers, have usurped the rights of princes, and have even erred in defining matters of faith and morals. Wrong. 24. The Church has not the power of using force, nor has she any temporal power, direct or indirect. Wrong. 25. Besides the power inherent in the episcopate, other temporal power has been attributed to it by the civil authority granted either explicitly or tacitly, which on that account is revocable by the civil authority whenever it thinks fit. Wrong. 26. The Church has no innate and legitimate right of acquiring and possessing property. Wrong. 27. The sacred ministers of the Church and the Roman pontiff are to be absolutely excluded from every charge and dominion over temporal affairs. Wrong. 28. It is not lawful for bishops to publish even letters apostolic without the permission of government. Wrong. 29. Favors granted by the Roman pontiff ought to be considered null unless they have been sought forth through the civil government. Wrong. 30. The immunity of the church and of ecclesiastical persons derived its origin from civil law. Wrong. 31. The ecclesiastical forum or tribunal for the temporal causes, whether civil or criminal, of clerics, ought by all means to be abolished, even without consulting and against the protest of the Holy See. Wrong. 32. The personal immunity by which clerics are exonerated from military conscription and service in the army may be abolished without violation either of natural right or equity. Its abolition is called for by civil progress, especially in a society framed on the model of a liberal government. Wrong. 33. It does not appertain exclusively to the power of ecclesiastical jurisdiction by right, proper and innate, to direct the teaching of theological questions. Wrong. 34. The teaching of those who compare the sovereign pontiff to a prince 
free and acting in the universal church is a doctrine which prevailed in the Middle Ages. Wrong. 35. There is nothing to prevent the decree of a general council or the act of all peoples from transferring the supreme pontificate from the bishop and city of Rome to another bishop in another city. Wrong. 36. The definition of a national council does not admit of any subsequent discussion, and the civil authority can assume this principle as the basis of its acts. Wrong. 37. National churches, withdrawn from the authority of the Roman pontiff and altogether separated, can be established. Wrong. 38. The Roman pontiffs have, by their too arbitrary conduct, contributed to the division of the church into Eastern and Western. Wrong. Number 6. Errors about civil society consider both in itself and its relation to the church. 39. The state, as being the origin and source of all rights, is endowed with a certain right not circumscribed by any limits. Wrong. 40. The teaching of the Catholic Church is hostile to the well-being and interest of society. Wrong. 41. The civil government, even when in the hands of an infidel sovereign, has a right to an indirect negative power over religious affairs. It therefore possesses not only the right called that of exequatur, but also that of appeal called appellatio ab abusu, wrong. 42. In the case of conflicting laws enacted by the two powers, the civil law prevails. Wrong. 43. The secular dower has authority to rescind, declare, and render null solemn conventions, commonly called concordats, enter into with the apostolic see regarding the use of rights appertaining to ecclesiastical immunity without the consent of the apostolic see and even in spite of its protest. Wrong. 44. The civil authority may interfere in matters relating to religion, morality, and spiritual government. Hence, it can pass judgment on the instructions issued for the guidance of consciences conformably with their mission by the pastors of the church. Further, it has the right to make enactments regarding the administration of the divine sacraments, and the dispositions necessary for receiving them. Wrong. 45. The entire government of public schools in which the youth of a Christian state is educated, except, to a certain extent, in the case of Episcopal seminaries, may and ought to appertain to the civil power and belong to it so far that no other authority whatsoever shall be recognized as having any right to interfere in the discipline of the schools, the arrangement of the studies, the conferring of degrees, and the choice or approval of the teachers. Wrong. 46. Moreover, even in ecclesiastical seminaries, the method of studies to be adopted is subject to the civil authority. Wrong. 47. The best theory of civil society requires the popular schools open to children of every class of the people, and generally all public institutes intended for instruction in letters and philosophical sciences and for carrying on the education of youth should be freed from all ecclesiastical authority, control, and interference, and should be fully subjected to the civil and political power at the pleasure of the rulers and according to the standard of the prevalent opinions of the age. Wrong. 48. Catholics may approve of the system of educating youth unconnected with Catholic faith and the power of the Church, and which regards the knowledge of merely natural things and only, or at least primarily, the ends of earthly social life. Wrong. 49. The civil power may prevent the prelates of the church and the faithful from communicating freely and mutually with the Roman pontiff. Wrong. 50. Lay authority possesses of itself the right of presenting bishops 
and may require of them to undertake the administration of the diocese before they receive canonical institution and the letters apostolic from the Holy See. Wrong. 51. And further, the lay government has the right of deposing bishops from their pastoral functions and is not bound to obey the Roman pontiff in those things which relate to the institution of bishoprics and the appointment of bishops. Wrong. 52. Government can, by its own right, alter the age prescribed by the church for the religious profession of women and men, and may require of all religious orders to admit no person to take solemn vows without its permission. Wrong. 53. The laws enacted for the protection of religious orders and regarding their rights and duties ought to be abolished. Nay, more, civil government may lend its assistance to all who desire to renounce the obligation which they have undertaken of a religious life and to break their vows. Government may also suppress the said religious orders, as likewise collegiate churches and simple benefices, even those of Albausen, and subject their property and revenues to the administration and pleasure of the civil power. Wrong. 54. Kings and princes are not only exempt from the jurisdiction of the church, but are superior to the church in deciding questions of jurisdiction. Wrong. 55. The church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. Wrong. Number 7. Errors Concerning Natural and Christian Ethics 56. Moral laws do not stand in need of the divine sanction, and it is not at all necessary that human laws should be conformable to the laws of nature and receive their power of binding from God. Wrong. 57. The science of philosophical things and morals and also civil laws may and ought to keep aloof from divine and ecclesiastical authority. Wrong. 58. No other forces are to be recognized except those which reside in matter, and all the rectitude and excellence of morality ought to be placed in the accumulation and increase of riches by every possible means and the gratification of pleasure. Wrong. 59. Right consists in the material fact. All human duties are an empty word, and all human facts have the force of right. Wrong. 60. Authority is nothing else but numbers and the sum total of material forces. Wrong. 61. The injustice of an act, when successful, inflicts no injury on the sanctity of right. Wrong. 62. The principle of non-intervention, as it is called, ought to be proclaimed and observed. Wrong. 63. It is lawful to refuse obedience to legitimate princes and even to rebel against them. Wrong. 64. The violation of any solemn oath, as well as any wicked and flagitious action repugnant to the eternal law, is not only not blamable, but it's altogether lawful and worthy of the highest praise when done through love of country. Wrong. Number 8. Errors Concerning Christian Marriage 65. The doctrine that Christ has raised marriage to the dignity of a sacrament cannot be at all tolerated. Wrong. 66. The sacrament of marriage is only a something accessory to the contract and separate from it, and the sacrament itself consists in the nuptial benediction alone. Wrong. 67. By the law of nature, the marriage tie is not indissoluble, and in many cases divorce properly so-called may be decreed by the civil authority. Wrong. 68. The church has not the power of establishing derriment impediments of marriage, but such a power belongs to the civil authority by which existing impediments are to be removed. Wrong. In the Dark Ages, the church began to establish derriment impediments not by her own right, but by using a power borrowed from the state. 
wrong. 70. The canons of the Council of Trent, which anathematized those who dared to deny to the church the right of establishing derriment impediments, either are not dogmatic or must be understood as referring to such borrowed power. Wrong. 71. The form of solemnizing marriage prescribed by the Council of Trent under pain of nullity does not bind in cases where the civil law lays down another form and declares that when this new form is used, the marriage shall be valid. Wrong. 72. Boniface VIII was the first who declared that the vow of chastity taken at ordination renders marriage void. Wrong. 73. In force of a merely civil contract, there may exist between Christians a real marriage, and it is false to say either that the marriage contract between Christians is always a sacrament, or that there is no contract if the sacrament be excluded. Wrong. 74. Matrimonial causes and espousals belong by their nature to civil tribunals. Wrong. Number 9. Errors regarding the civil power of the sovereign pontiff. 75. The children of the Christian and Catholic Church are divided amongst themselves about the compatibility of the temporal with the spiritual power. Wrong. 76. The abolition of the temporal power of which the apostolic see is possessed will contribute in the greatest degree to the liberty and prosperity of the Church. Wrong. Number 10. Errors having reference to modern liberalism. 77. In the present day, it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion should be held as the only religion of the state, to the exclusion of all other forms of worship. Wrong. 78. Hence, it has been wisely decided by law in some Catholic countries that persons coming to reside therein shall enjoy the public exercise of their own peculiar worship. Wrong. 79. Moreover, it is false that the civil liberty of every form of worship and the full power given to all of overtly and publicly manifesting any opinions whatsoever and thoughts conduce more easily to corrupt the morals and minds of the people and to propagate the pest of indifferentism. Wrong. 80. The Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself and come to terms with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. Wrong. Pope Pius IX's De Filius, reaffirming the teachings of the Church, was a brilliant move by the Pope to slow down the tide of modernism, which had already found its way into the Church on a major scale. We believe this dear Pope was given discernment about the tide of blasphemy which will be precipitated by the rise of secularism and the dreaded modernism movement which his successor, Pope St. Pius X, would come against and condemned at the beginning of the 20th century. Our dear saintly Pope Pius X thought he had destroyed modernism with his encyclical Lamentabili Sane Exitu, in April 1907, and Pascendi Dominici Gregis in November of the same year. However, modernism has never gone away. To the contrary, it reared its evil head very strongly after Vatican Council II. Another statement Bishop Fisicella made in his article in L'Osservatore Romano on September 13, 2000, is in regard to the second document presented to the Council and approved, Pastor Alternus. The Council's second document was Pastor Eternus. The Church presented the divine nature of her institution. The few words that formed the introduction to the Constitution are fundamental for understanding the sense of the Council's entire teaching on the primacy and infallibility of the Roman pontiff, so that the episcopate might be one and undivided, and that believers dispersed throughout the world might abide in the faith of all times and in the unity of communion, 
Christ established in Peter the visible and lasting principle of his church's unity. The discussions about the approval of the infallibility are well known. What is certainly clear is that the fathers at the council made a courageous choice. For some, it was a difficult one, but in each case, a decision of historical import was reached. The proclamation of infallibility embraced and expressed that sense of faith of all the baptized, which sees in Peter the rock on which Christ has indefectively and infallibly established his church. Our Pope was truly inspired by the Holy Spirit in the actions he took during his pontificate, but especially in convening Vatican Council I. He knew what was coming and fought with all he was worth to head it off. What he couldn't save in regard to the papal states and the patrimony of Peter, he was able to protect in holding on to the age-old teachings of the church. Come home, good and faithful servant. His last eight years were marked with battle, just the same as his previous 24. He refused to recognize the Italian government of Victor Emmanuel, and he never reconciled with the French for having deserted him, causing him to lose the little bit he had left of the Papal States. His greatest conflict in his final years was with Germany. Kultur Kampf, culture struggle, was enacted by Chancellor Bismarck against the Catholic Church in an attempt to bolster secular power in his country as opposed to church power. Bismarck imposed sanctions against the Catholic and Protestant churches. He suppressed the Jesuits, imprisoned hundreds of priests, and exiled many bishops. He imposed the Gallican rule on the church, making it subject to the laws of the state. This continued on aggressively until 1875, but relations between Bismarck and the church did not improve until the death of Pope Pius IX and the pontificate of Leo XIII. Continuing as a prisoner of the Vatican, God's hero, Pope Pius IX, died on February 7, 1878. While the cause for his beatification was open early in the 20th century, 1907, it wasn't until September 3, 2000, that he was beatified alongside fellow Pope John the 23rd. It was symbolic that both popes were beatified together, seeing as both popes convened ecumenical councils, one following the other, albeit almost a hundred years apart. We believe a saint, blessed John Paul II, beatified two saints, Popes Pius IX and John XXIII. Although Pope John XXIII lived in our lifetime, because of our studies on the operations of Our Lady and the saints who lived during the time of Pope Pius IX, we feel a special kinship towards him. We actually believe we know him better. We pray for the intercession of Blessed Pope Pius IX to counter the brutal attacks our Church is enduring today. We ask for his prayers, especially for our Pope, Benedict XVI, as he labors towards anchoring the ship of the Church in between those two great strengths, the Eucharist and Mother Mary. Blessed Pope Pius IX, pray for us.